Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this event to commemorate the life and work of Arthur Selden, the Editorial Director of the Institute of Economic Affairs for 30 years, and a major contributor to the revival of classical liberalism in the, across the world, really, in the uh, last years of the 20th century. This month marks, I think, 15 years since uh, Arthur died, uh, economic and social liberalism are now again under threat and it seems an appropriate moment to reflect on Arthur's life and also on the wider issues of the future of liberty. And I'm very pleased that we can be joined tonight by Arthur's youngest son, Sir Anthony Selden. Anthony is, I'm sure, well known to most of you as a distinguished author and educationalist. I'm very pleased indeed that he can join us. Welcome, uh, Anthony. Uh, Len, thank you very much indeed for having me on. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining tonight. And it's going to be, uh, I hope, uh, a really stimulating hour. And thanks to the IEA for hosting it. Well, to begin with, Anthony, um, for the benefit of younger viewers, as it were, uh, who may not have known Arthur personally, can you quickly sketch for us this salient feature of your dad's life uh, from his rather traumatic childhood, uh, his upbringing in the East End of London through to uh, his later career? I mean, it's a very interesting story. It, it is, Len. Uh, how far do you want me to, to go? Um, should we stop? I'll stop you when it gets to... Uh, <laughs> okay. Too far. Um, Right, so Arthur Selden was born in May 1916, so um, a, a month just before the Battle of the Somme. He will have uh, heard the, uh, uh, the, the guns from the, from the Somme battle, if the wind was right. It drifted across the channel all the way into London, and he was born um, to two um, youngish uh, Jewish uh, people who came over from the Ukraine and they came in about 1903 or 1904 to escape persecutions and in search of a, a better life. I mean they didn't really find that better economic life um, and he worked in a very humble way in the east end of London and there were five children altogether. Arthur was the youngest, he was called Abraham and he um, uh, was then too young to, to have understood about the uh, flu, Spanish flu epidemic after the uh, First World War. Um, not unlike COVID, but unlike in the extent of the uh, death rate, 50 million worldwide, as opposed to 1 million for COVID at the moment, but counting. And both his parents were, were uh, died about a week apart. And um, so the family then ha had no parents. And uh, Arthur, as the youngest, was inherited sorry, was adopted by, by uh, a Jewish woman who came from uh, Moscow and uh, Russia and um, had stepfathers and was brought up in great poverty. Didn't know that he had brothers and sisters until he was a young teenager. And um, so, should I stop there or, or carry on then? No, I mean, that's, that's, that's uh, very interesting, particularly the... the, the uh... Uh, the death of his parents uh, so early and, uh, the, you know, the effects yeah. that this must have had on him. And, and I found in reading about his childhood, the, the, the fact that he didn't, he, he didn't know that he had these brothers until, yeah. uh, until he was, uh, it, this must have produced a, a lasting effect on him, I would have thought. I, I don't know. Right? Well, we're all affected, uh, aren't we, by our upbringing. I mean, we cannot mm. but be affected by our upbringing. And um, so to, to suddenly be in, in a single child family 
or what we think was a single child family, uh, rather than being one of five and no doubt pampered by the uh, other four, he would surely have been dimly aware of that. Uh, but he didn't knowingly uh, realize he had brothers and sisters, three brothers, one sister, till um, they made themselves known to him as a certain amount of opposition from that. Uh, and that clearly affected him. He went to a elementary school in the East End of London, Rain's Foundation, uh, was obviously bright, uh, came across a couple of teachers, as so often for um, everyone. It, it, it's that ability of a teacher to ignite a fire in a student at school that can give them a sense of an aspiration. Uh, and he went on to the London School of Economics, where he fell under the influence, willingly fell under the influence of, of great figures in the liberal economic tradition, like Lionel Robbins, uh, Arnold Plant, less well known, and um, uh, Hayek. Um, and it was an extraordinary place to be um, in the mid late 30s. He met many lifelong friends there, including uh, Basil Yemi, uh, who became a very distinguished professor at LSE and very connected with the IEA. Um, and I think at last you know, he began to find himself uh, and find a sense of pride. And we can you know, speculate, but we can't know that that experience that he had of coming out of acute poverty, uh, a lot of people claim uh, that they come out of acute poverty, but for him it really was. Um, uh, and supported by the Jewish fraternity, a uh, very uh, paternalistic society of Jewish families in the London streets together looking after each other. But that sense that he had made it up powerfully informed his sense that about the human spirit and the desire not to be a victim and to, to make one's own way and to make one's own weather. And LSE was just a stunning experience for him. Can I just ask you a bit about uh, the LSC? Because, of course, uh, you, you've drawn attention to the, 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 the uh, liberal figures, the classical liberal figures, Hayek and, and, and Plant, and, and uh, you know, drawing on the tradition of people like Cannon and so forth. But there were, uh, there were other influences at the LSC. The LSC was founded, of course, by the Fabians. Mm. Uh, in, and uh, at the time that, that Arthur was at the LSC as a student, there were people like Harold Lasky, Abba Lerner, Nicky Caldor, Evan Durbin, uh, all sorts of people like this who had a very different take on the economy. Uh, why do you think it was that Arthur fell in with a particular approach rather than another one? Well, the honest answer, Len, is that I, I don't know, and I think that the answer to that is unknowable. Why right. did any of us... What, you you know, but I mean, it's a great question. It's a great question, uh, <laughs> and of course, it wasn't just those figures you mentioned at LSE and the founding spirit of the LSE, collectivist, uh, a desire the state was expanding. I mean, the state had been tiny before the First World War, with a very minimalist vision about what the role of the state was, and coming out of the legislation just before the First World War with pensions coming in and national insurance in 1908-1911, powerfully informed by that liberal progressive uh, vision. Uh, you know, th that was very much the zeitgeist, that the, the interwar Tories were very paternalistic. Uh, Labour had just formed its first government in 1924, again in 1929 to 1931, and the forces on the right were not identified as the classical liberal economics um, uh, voices. The forces on the right were identified with fascism uh, and national socialism uh, and with Mussolini and Franco. And, and uh, while he, uh, my father was at LSE, the Spanish Civil War was being fought uh, as a struggle uh, uh, to put down the, uh, in rather Trump-like terms, the way that Trump denigrates his opponents uh, as 
you know, socialists and communists. Uh, so, so, uh, so was anybody on the centre and left denigrated? So it was a time of great polarisation. I remember my father saying to me very early on when I was in my teens that the thirst is you have to choose. You either were choosing um, the right or, or the left. The middle ground wasn't there. So, I mean, I, you know, quite why did he alight on these people? Why did he write his first a pamphlet in when he was only 20, which was an anti-collectivist, uh, pro-independence uh, uh, of mind, uh, liberal pamphlet when he was only 20. You know, I, I think it's, a, you know, we, we put forward reasons for why we adopt the, the views we do. I mean, he would, of course, say he adopted it because it was right uh, and everybody else were, was wrong. And, <laughs> Uh, and, and that's why he adopted it. Uh, but I'm sure he was charmed and persuaded you know, by these people. Maybe they'd taken you know, personal interest in him. He became Plant's research, um, researcher after he'd, got, he'd taken his first. So. Yeah, Pl Plant's quite an interesting figure, actually, to be a, 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 an influence on, on Arthur, because on, on, he, he wasn't a high theorist. He was essentially a an empirical economist, but in the old-fashioned old empirical sense, he wasn't an econometrician or anything like that. He was interested in the nuts and bolts of particular industries and things like that. And do you think that had a, a, a lasting influence on Arthur? Well, that's interesting again then. I mean, his degree was in, in he was a Bachelor of Commerce. Mm. Um, mm. He took it, I think he got it in uh, 37, he, so that was when he would just have been 21, so that, that fits. He was always very interested in, in business and the operation of the firm and the theory of the, thir the firm uh, and uh, how uh, growth occurred. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, you, I, can, I can see, I mean, maybe he got that from Plant. I mean, you're you're making me think about things um, uh, that uh, I haven't thought about uh, before. Uh, and then it, he, he then seemed to, you know, that there was a dark period where we lose his life. Uh, he went off to Italy. We, I don't know. He didn't like talking about uh, the war. I mean, he, he would become very morose uh, when I spoke to him and my brother Peter spoke to him about it. Um, uh, he just wasn't comfortable. He, he, mm -hmm. We know he fought in uh, Italy, uh, in North Africa. Uh, we know that he got, um, he almost died. He was saved by penicillin, the family folklore that is probably true, is that without penicillin, newly uh, discovered and distributed, he would have died. He um, had an infection that, gave him a lifelong uh, immobility in his arm uh, and whether he was then um, you know paraded out but but suddenly he turns up in uh, about 47 editing a magazine called Store uh, and that's when he meets my mother in um, uh, artillery mansions in Victoria Street. I think uh, we, we'll come to your mother in a moment because I want to uh, it is actually I think you told me today is her 101st birthday today so it, it, so. it is um she would we'll come been. to her in a moment I just want to ask you a question about the, the immediate post-war career that Arthur was in because he he worked for this magazine store which was a retail magazine and then he worked for brewers didn't he for for, yeah. for uh, seven or eight years something like yeah. that this, uh, um, I wonder whether this, uh, you know, this experience of corporate interests actually, in a sense, turned him against uh, some aspects of business. Um, I mean, for example, they, 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 the brewer's business of tied houses was something he was very against, wasn't it? But he must have, while he was working for the brewery interests, he must have had to go along with that. So I just wondered how that affected his uh, approach to economics later on. I should have said before, uh, Len, that there's a brilliant biography by Colin Robinson uh, about Arthur Selden, and if people want to know, know more, 
Um, I mean, it's always uh, slightly of the biographer out of the family knows much more about one's father, but you know, it, it's full of wonderful uh, things uh, in it. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I mean, dad, dad working for a brewer, I mean, that was very counterintuitive <laughs> then. I, yes. I mean, a less boozy person uh, you couldn't imagine. I, I don't think I ever in my life went for a pint with dad in, in a pub. I mean, the notion of him being in a pub, you know, you just couldn't see that. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I never ever saw him worse for yeah. uh, wear. Um, so I mean, he was always very kind of moderate in in, in what he uh, did. Uh, but I mean, I think he had a passion for firms and a, a passion for the freedom of entrepreneurs to be able to operate um, uh, without the state uh, being an intrusive mm -hmm. force. You know, at this very time, we have Clement Attlee coming to power at the head of the only genuinely uh, socialist government uh, that the country has seen. And of course, what's so interesting about that, it nationalises the commanding heights of the economy. It sets up the uh, NHS in July 1948. It even nationalises steel, for goodness sake, and iron and, and road Hauliers, I, I mean, whatever next. Um, and, and what's so interesting is that the Conservative Party um, goes along with it. Um, and when they return to power in October 1951, by which time he's still working for the Brewers, um, they don't uh, reverse um, the welfare state, uh, extensive welfare state, or the Town and Country Planning Acts. Uh, they don't reverse nationalizations with the, ex with, with, with the mild exceptions of parts of iron and steel uh, and, and road hauliers that haven't really been um, nationalized at all uh, by the time they got back to power. So, you know, there is very much uh, what was called at the time, what the economists called uh, butskalism, taking the name of the, uh, as you know, the Labour Chancellor, uh, Hugh Gates School went on to become Labour leader, but not Prime Minister. And the first Tory Prime Minister under Churchill were, was Rab Butler. So Buttskillism from Butler and Gateskill. And it meant a continuity with a very left of centre vision. And again, you know, there were not uh, the voices. So his was a lone uh, voice advocating the market, the Mont Pelerin Society. Maybe you asked me about that. Um, you know, was, you know, beginning, um, and there were figures like Erhardt in, in, in uh, West Germany, um, as it was by, by then, um, uh, beginning, um, uh, and so there were currents of classical liberalism, but even in the US, um, you know, Eisenhower, the Republican president from November, from January 1980. Sorry, January 1953 was was you know not a Reagan or not even a Nixon uh, in terms of um, having a different, more Adam Smith classical liberal mm -hmm. economics vision of the need for private enterprise to be able to operate without um, heavy and high rates of, of, of corporation tax and mm -hmm. income tax. I, what I was getting at before was that I, I, I wonder whether Arthur's sympathies were more with smaller businesses, medium-sized businesses, rather than the big, uh, the big uh, complexes, the big brewers, and, and so forth. Um, yes, I think I think that definitely. Uh, because at this time he was, of course, fairly closely involved with the Liberal Party, wasn't he? He wasn't in, he was. never involved with the Conservative Party, and and that. You know that historically had perhaps been a bit more pro competition, I think, than than the Conservative Party. He uh, absolutely uh, he, um, he he saw himself as supporting the underdog, um, and he would no doubt have seen some of the actions of the big corporations, the multinational um, as they so international organisations and TNCs, he would have seen them as adopting some of the behaviours of, of, of the state. So he was very much a champion of, of 
uh, the, 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 the small battalions of capitalism, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, can, can we come on to talking about your mother? Because, I mean, that's a, a, we could almost have a, a session devoted to her uh, ideas, I think. But uh, she met uh, your father in when? In, in, in the well, late 19th uh, we, we don't know. And, and like every um, person talking to this whose parents have died, uh, you regret, of course, that you didn't talk to them yes. more. But it would have yes. been, you know, during the period of the, the post-war Atlee government in, um, in that probably, probably that terrible winter of uh, 47. Um, they married in February uh, 48. They had to marry in secret uh, because uh, the stepmother who carried on uh, looking after my father uh, wouldn't have accepted the fact that she wasn't uh, Jewish. Um, and uh, she, she herself came, so, so it was a, 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 uh, a covert uh, wedding. Uh, they had, they had one night, um, they got married in a registry office in Tunbridge uh, and had a, a one night uh, with five people present, I think, and one night at the ho at a hotel in Eastbourne. So um, not a not a splashy, flashy wedding. Uh, and my mother's um, family, her father had become a communist. And as, after his experiences in the First World War, um, and he couldn't carry on working, so he went the other way um, and became very friendly with the writer Henry Williamson, who wrote Tarka the Otter, uh, but then when he became a, a fascist um, and went right, my grandfather went further and further left and, uh, and, and wrote for the Daily Worker, um, which was the Communist Party newspaper. So, you know, that was quite a rich brew. Um, and, but my mother didn't share that um, ultra left wing view. Um, I, I, and, and she became a, a, a passionate intellectual ally as well as obviously emotionally um, hugely supportive. She was um, particularly associated with the promotion of educational vouchers wasn't she? I think that's one of her uh, intellectual interests. Um, as an educationist yourself why do you think um, education vouchers were never really accepted? Okay so the history there is that they um, uh, she came with her um, uh, son by a, a, an earlier marriage and who my father was very uh, happy, obviously, to, to have as a stepson all the way through his life. And they paid for him to go to a small private prep school, Dulwich Prep in, in London, and then on to a boarding school in, in Devon that took all day and a night to drive down to in those days on the A30. And I think that she felt that because they had stripped and scraped to um, pay for a, a private education, others can and should be able to do that. And they did that the same for um, my full brother and, and me also. And I think there was that belief that she had that you, you should be able to choose. And she had the same resentment about a big brother uh, state. Um, I mean, a counter intellectual current at the time was, was the reaction against what became seen as the excesses of Stalinism uh, and, and the oppressive dictatorial state. Um, you see that in The Road to Serfdom by Hayek, and you see that in from a different perspective in Orwell's 1984, published in 1948. And, and she, you know, very much resented the, the idea of an oppressive state telling you where to go and where to send your children. She wanted every child to uh, go to the school that the parents selected because she believed that. Um, not without reason that if the parents are merely told your child goes to this school, there's less of a sense of valuing that than if there is a choice. And the voucher uh, was the um, passport, it was the payment 
that followed the child. Uh, so why didn't it go anywhere? I think it landed in the wrong decade. Um, it, um, it, it, she formed up with uh, a former comprehensive school teacher called Rhodes Boyson, who at the time was head of a school called Highbury Grove near the Arsenal in North London. And um, uh, they, they formed uh, this campaign, a pressure group called Fever Together. There was a place called Alum Rock in the United States where an experiment had taken place. But whereas you had Nixon in America who was more interested in uh, the market, uh, the, you had Ted Heath who was very corporatist as the conservative leader between 1970 to 74. This was the high point of corporatism, of uh, big business operating with big unions, with government together, um, a different kind of model uh, from a representative democracy. Uh, and it didn't land in the right decade. And then end of February 74, there was a general election that um, uh, Harold Wilson won, albeit a minority government. He called an election later that year uh, and, and came back with just a, a, you know, a slight majority. Wilson wasn't going to go for vouchers any more than uh, Heath was. Um, and that's why it was so uh, interesting when, uh, an exciting time, when um, the, the, the Centre for Policy Studies was born in 1974. I worked for it in my first holidays from university with Keith Joseph and Margaret Thatcher and others. Um, and, and that uh, w w was significant because although the IEA had already been in existence for some 15 and more years, um, it, 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 now it was getting a political punch. Jeffrey Howe uh, was a very significant figure. He'd had a group with the Bow Group um, of conservative MPs. Enoch Powell was, um, when he wasn't off on Ireland and, uh, uh, and other uh, topics, was very attracted to the operation of the free market. Um, and it was the beginning of a counter-revolution in thinking and, and the currents of monetarism coming in from Chicago in the West and across from the Austrian school across the English Channel in the East. Um, and, and then the supplanting uh, by Heath of, of Thatcher, but we shouldn't think of Thatcher early on uh, as a, you know, somebody who embraced uh, the IEA's way of thinking uh, totally. It, it, she mm -hmm. was on a journey. But somebody who did um, go along with a lot of the IEA's thinking was Sir Keith Joseph. And yeah. there must have been some disappointment uh, on Arthur's part and Marjorie's part uh, when uh, he didn't uh, act more radically when he was a minister. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so, so, so Thatcher appoints him, very interestingly, appoints him Education Secretary mm. in 1979. Um, and yeah, she could have appointed, she appoints Howe uh, as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Mm. Uh, and she could have, education at the time wasn't the very important government department that it now has become. I mean, it's almost you know, the, the third or fourth most significant cabinet position. Um, it wasn't anything like that at the time. Thatcher herself had been Minister of Education under Heath, and it was the job you give to the necessary woman um, who you have to have in your cabinet. Um, and of course, she wasn't uh, at all a free enterprise, free thinker, pro-voucher, pro-choice, uh, school choice, um, uh, sector of state at all. She was really very statist. Both she and, and Joseph spending was higher. Well, they were the two highest spenders, I think, uh, needs to be confirmed. The two highest spenders in Ted Heath's government. So there was nothing about the little state from then. Nevertheless, Thatcher becomes PM in May 1979, appoints 
Joseph, he then had that opportunity to um, introduce these ideas. Uh, and my father wrote a book called the, called the Riddle of the Education Voucher, which was trying to explain the conundrum about why it didn't happen. Uh, and blame was put on civil servants. I think probably unfairly, there was somebody I remember called Walter Ulrich. Um, there was somebody called William Pyle um, as permanent secretary for a time. I mean, none of them liked it. And by and large, uh, civil servants don't like radical, fresh ideas. But the point is that they go along with them, as they've shown in government after government, where a secretary of state, the ministers are clear about what they're doing. And I would have thought it was much more uh, Keith's um, failure to give that clear lead uh, than, than the fact it was Kai I mean, it's a bit weak, isn't it, to say that, you know, it didn't happen because the civil servants. I mean, you know, strong ministers always, but always, uh, which is why I think that the current, uh, the, the, the current demonising of civil servants and the ethos of the civil service is so wrong. Throughout history, effective ministers always get their way through the civil service. Okay, let's, let's, let's move on a bit. I, I, I mean, we've spoken about your mother. Um, another relationship, if you like, which was a, an important feature of Arthur's life was, was his relationship with Ralph Harris. Yeah. And I, I wondered if you could talk us through that a little bit. They met up in the, uh, around 1957, 58, that kind of time. Um, I think Ralph was first the director general, or general director or something of the, appointed by Anthony Fisher and, and Arthur joins slightly later. Um, what, what, well, it, it, it's that. a, you know, it, it's the Lennon and McCartney relationship or um, Simon and Garfunkel. It, it's it's um, extraordinarily successful. You know, we have to ask the question about the IEA. Why did the IEA survive when uh, there were so few pre pressure groups, intellectual pressure groups, think tanks at the time. Why did it make the mark it did when the intellectual climate, political climate was so against it for the first 20 years? Um, and even after Thatcher came into office, she was in significant ways lukewarm towards the IEA. Um, and you know, how did it survive uh, and why did it spawn so many other uh, think tanks that may or may not say that they, they owe their spawning to it? Uh, many would flatly deny it. But you have the Adam Smith Institute, Centre for Policy Studies, as I mentioned, a whole range of think tanks on the um, left and, and in the centre ground why did the IEA uh, survive? Why did it grow? Why did it have the impact when it did, when it was planted in uh, unfertile soil? Um, and I think part of it was down to the extraordinary brilliance of that relationship between uh, my father, who was a, above all, an intellectual and passionate about the uh, thinking of the IEA and was respected by intellectual academic economists uh, the world over and he helped bring them into the IEA but he wasn't an organization person or, um, uh, or a, a public face. Uh, he was, uh, he liked people, he was very charming, very good with people but didn't have the uh, organizational interest uh, that Ralph had or the money raising uh, capability of Ralph. Uh, Ralph passionate obviously about all of this came out of St Andrews had written interestingly and forgotten. He wrote a book about R.A. Butler, that Chancellor of the Exchequer who almost became, twice almost became Conservative Party leader. Um, and um, so, so Ralph and, and he bond together, they're extraordinarily close. Tensions appeared uh, in the mid and, and latter stages of their relationship. That's bound to 
happen uh, uh, and jealousies and frustrations and resentments. I think what's remarkable is not that they happened, but that for so long, their relationship was so positive. And I think it did play uh, a really decisive role in the IEA emerging uh, and becoming that very strong force. Um, and then, of course, after they left, um, you know, very successful people have come and, and taken it forward. You often need different skills um, to, to start something up and nurture it and see it through uh, to make the impact from those then um, who, who take it on um, once it's a mature mm -hmm. organization. Well, clearly they're, they're very different people. I, I mean, when you'd see, you know, the occasions, I, I used to go to the IEA in the 80s and so on. You, you, you know, your, your father was a very diffident. I, I, you spoke that he had a stammer before. He was not a public speaker, whereas uh, Arthur, uh, Ralph was a, a very uh, in-your-face, very lively, you know, with his bow ties and his funny jackets, uh, funny uh, uh, waistcoats and this kind of stuff. Um, but you, you, you spoke before of, 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 of uh, Lennon McCartney and Simon and Garfunkel. And of course, uh, the two you chose there are, are, are couples which had very big breakdowns in their careers and rows and, and splits and so forth. Um, there was never any real hint of this in, in the relationship between Arthur and Ralph. Well, you're going to always uh, in very creative relationships. I mean, it's not a marriage. Um, there isn't uh, the, the, the sense of being in love. That, that, that this isn't. That they're not lovers. They're not uh, lifelong uh, partners. That they don't have children together. They don't have all those shared, you know, memories. Uh, they are uh, working together. Um, uh, Ralph was everything you say, a, a, a brilliant, magnetic, charismatic uh, figure, larger than life, um, uh, not forgetting his pipe and his, his, mm -hmm. his smoking, he was passionate about the, the uh, you see that, uh, you see that same strand in those people who are uh, furious about um, the state intruding too much now in, in COVID. I mean, Ralph would have been right out there in the barricades. He'd have been a Sinat, uh, <laughs> not a Johnson, um, uh, wanting to have maximum possible freedom. Um, and uh, um, it worked, the relationship, because they were so different. Ralph, essentially extrovert. My father, uh, much more introvert, introvert. Interesting to know, Len, what would have happened without the stammer uh, that... Uh, seemed to have gone back to those early experiences, discovering that he had four um, siblings, um, that he was adopted, um, that sense of you know, insecurity, not always knowing genuinely where the next meal was going to come from, um, uh, that, that, that worry. And, and the stammer did hold him back. He would have wanted to have been more on television. Uh, more on radio, uh, more um, a, a, an advocate, but he tried painfully. Uh, one thinks of the King's speech and George the Sixth. Uh, he didn't find his Logie. You know, he didn't find somebody who was able uh, to help him get through that. Um, so that was a restraint, um, and the, the relationship. Um, I, that they saw differently. Interesting, University of Buckingham was one of the frustrations, um, founded in 1976, and um, had Max Belloff, later Lord Belloff, um, fellow of All Souls as the first um, vice chancellor, wasn't called vice chancellor at the time, but was there for the first couple of years. Ralph, very involved in setting up the University of Buckingham as Britain's first independent uh, university, uh, but uh, my father resented the fact that he spent so much time trying to raise money for Buckingham, having run Buckingham for five years, and um, we're, you know, it's a wonderful, special, unique uh, university, and it's now got a brilliant medical school, 
Uh, there was a wonderful vice chancellor before me, Terence Keeley, uh, who founded the medical school and much else. I mean, you know, I know, he will have known that Ralph's job of finding money for the University of Buckingham is really hard. Uh, I mean, we mm -hmm. found lots, but it, it was backbreaking. So my father resented that. They disagreed over Europe. Um, uh, Ralph was one of the very early supporters of the uh, uh, of what became Brexit. Uh, my father uh, saw it as an enormous trading uh, centre, and what on earth is the sense uh, of not trading uh, or cutting off uh, trade uh, with your biggest partner? Um, and so that was another difference. There were jealousies over the running. Uh, of the office, um, and I think my father would have felt that much of the IP of what happened with the Institute came out of his uh, relationships, and you know, Ralph, while undoubtedly a brilliant, brilliant mind, um, didn't carry on uh, writing creatively in the same way that my father did. They'd written early books together, uh, advertising in a free society, for example. Um, uh, but, but Ralph didn't carry on with the life of the mind in the way that my father did. My father wrote a, 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 a number of books, um, including a long book on capitalism, which was in some ways his magnum opus. Um, but, but Ralph you know, went off in different ways. So that, you know, you, I, I think that, that that what's important is that the IEA worked and, and and it held together and they handed it on to the successors to take forward to what is you know an amazingly successful powerhouse that it is today, and that the frustrations that they had with each other uh, mutually. Uh, didn't um, you know? Uh, was was encompassed. I mean, the, you know, I said they weren't lovers, uh, and uh, they weren't. I mean, genuinely. Um, and uh, but you know, they, they had a lot of love for each other, um, and in, in significant ways were their closest friend. I mean, they knew each other better than anybody else knew each other. Uh, Greg, can we uh, perhaps come to your relationship with? With your father, what kind of father was he when you were growing up? Uh, well, I'm, I mean, Len, he was—he was the only dad I, I had, so I, I've got yeah. no—I've um, <laughs> got, got no kind of um, uh, a comparator there to evaluate him against. And um, he was always um, uh, very caring. Um, uh, very interested. He always worked very hard. He had a hut. In the bottom of the garden and uh, he would often be working uh, there. He spent a lot of his time editing meticulously the various uh, papers that came into the uh, IEA. Um, he uh, would uh, enjoy playing cricket which he did with his bent arm because of that uh, Second World War injury I talked about. He loved cricket um, uh, watching cricket, he loved going to the opera. Um, he, he was a um, he, he was a wonderful father, uh, and uh, took great pride in uh, my uh, older brother uh, who went into business and and uh, um, you know the point about you know, business there and his love of the firm and the economics of the firm. So. Uh, he was, I mean, you know, it's really hard, it's a hard question. It's a different uh, question. Anyone okay. uh, uh, looking at this, <laughs> if you think about your own uh, parents, you only have your own parent to reflect mm -hmm. on. And actually your, but, your understanding of your friend, the relationship your friends have with their parents it is very, it will be very particularized and seen through the prism of your own relationship. Yeah, sure. I think it's a really, it, it, it's a hard thing. I mean, you know, he gave a stable home. He made sacrifices, significant, very significant sacrifices to ensure we always had annual holidays. We went to Devon um, year after year. Um, 
I was, it wasn't until I was a teenager that we went to, uh, abroad um, and young teenager, uh, he paid for the school fees um, and he was loving, attentive, very interested in school progress uh, and was great. I mean, can I, can I ask you, uh, I, I mean, um, when, he, when he was in sort of middle age and you were a teenager, um, this was the sort of beginnings of the permissive society and all that kind of stuff. And I, I'm just wondering how, um, uh, how, how far socially liberal was, was Arthur? We know he was economically liberal. Well, that, that's a good question. I remember him talking about David Friedman, Milton Friedman's son, if I got that right, who yeah, was yeah. Uh, a libertarian mm. um, and wanted to legalise drugs. Uh, which seemed very radical at the time. Um, I don't think, and he it was very interested in the work of David Green, if I got that right, and, and extending out the social affairs unit. Uh, I think he, partly maybe coming back to that Jewish background, he was quite moralistic um, and, um, uh, and traditionalistic and even paternalistic in his own um, uh, mores. Um, you know, it was always excruciating, isn't it, for every child when you're watching television and, uh, and things were happening on screen that you wouldn't want to see with your parents. I mean, that was just uh, ranks mm -hmm. right up there in the most embarrassing moments. Yeah, I think we've all been one, through that. Of, of, of one's youth, that wouldn't be unusual. Um, uh, and he he was not a, he lived very much in the real world. He wasn't, when I went up to university, I spent a lot of time directing plays and, and he'd dutifully come and, and watch the plays. My mother, who, who uh, loved literature, would comment. I mean, he never, I don't know whether he ever particularly engaged with them. I don't remember him ever reading a novel. I don't think he ever read a novel or went uh, voluntarily to see plays, but he loved opera, but he loved opera for the music. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, um, but he was a romantic uh, uh, and he was sentimental. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, so I, I think uh, those currents passed him by. Mm -hmm. And, but his friends were, were very much um, uh, were, were ideological friends. And when was he happiest? He was happiest. Well, he was, he was often happy, but you know, amongst his happiest moments were hosting uh, garden parties at the house they had in the village outside Seven Oaks. Uh, he loved entertaining. I think he listed that who's who as one of his hobbies. Um, he loved having the IEA staff all down to um, uh, down to the garden garden party. He loved you know, showing um, off and giving people a, a nice time and you know, chatting to everybody. So he was very gregarious, despite mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, that stutter. Um, and um, but but you know traditional. But you know he was there was something really quite Jewish about him all the way, even though he disowned Judaism, came back to it. You know, later on in his life, um, uh, to, really towards the end. Uh, did he actually, um, how is his, uh, do you think about your, your emerging career? What did, he, what did he think about you becoming first a school teacher and then becoming an author? What did he think about that? Well, he wasn't that keen on, on uh, schools. Uh, he kind of thought, hang about, you know, uh, uh, so I'd been, uh, so I did PP at Oxford, uh, and then I went down to LSE and, and did a doctorate. And, and he kind of imagined, uh, he was very happy with my, what my other two brothers had done. But I think he imagined that I would have, you know, keep up the intellectual tradition. And uh, then when I became a school teacher, I think he just thought, hello, um, you know, is this, really um, what uh, you should be doing. And that was you know, slightly disparaging, but didn't uh, put um, him off at all. He was very pleased, by the way, when I married a Jewish 
wife. Um, um, I mean, he loved that. Um, and then when I started writing books too, um, as well as teaching, well, he got excited about that, you know, you know because that was like, <laughs> that was something that mattered more than, than school teaching did. Um, so, I mean, and I'm sure that, you know, look, we're, we've all been massively influenced by our parents in ways that we probably don't even think about or that we would reject uh, as untrue. I mean, often when we say things are not true, uh, the opposite is true, they are. Um, and I'm sure that part of the, the, the driving force for me in writing books when I was also a school teacher was somehow trying to please him, uh, but also show that, you know, I could do more than uh, than teach. By the way, I think that uh, teaching is a fantastic profession and more than enough it, itself. Um, I can think of, actually, I can think of no profession which is more important than teaching. Um, so, you know, and then when I went on and became a head, uh, I think that was exciting for him. I, probably that's reflecting, Len, you know, his own insecurity, professional insecurity about income and uh, uh but also status you know and if you if you're ahead you know you, you've got um some kind of status in in yeah, society yeah, yeah. um so, so but he was always very loving and supportive heaps of uh letters some of which i've i've re found now moving house um you know an amazing person but somebody who's whose intellectual life overlapped very precisely with his social uh, life. Um, he was never happier than when he was talking to people about the free market, mm. um, free market ideas. And um, yeah. well, well, one of the things that strikes you, I think, uh, it, uh, and perhaps we could um, finish off on this, is his uh, positivist, uh, his, his positivity about uh, the market and about liberty. Uh, I mean, many of the, the younger people at the IEA will remember, we had this on the wall somewhere, his, from, from his uh, capitalism book, China will go capitalist, Soviet Russia will not survive the century, labor as we know it will never rule again. These were his, his predictions in the, uh, about 1990, I think, around that yeah. time. Um, very optimistic. Um, would he be so optimistic today, do you think? Well, that's uh, another great question. I, I, your questions have been so much better than my answers. Um, I think he would, um, sorry to say this, um, I don't think he would think that Brexit makes any kind of economic or political sense. I think he did have a strong sense about the insecurity of Europe, born in the First World War, went through the fascism, the splitting of Europe in the 30s, the Second World War, the, the memories of the Holocaust. I think he'd have seen the EU as a powerful bastion of political stability as well as economic um, stability. Um, I don't think he would have supported a found Trump while he would have admired some of his economic policies, I think he'd have found him ugly, uh, his boastfulness just mm. inappropriate, mm. inappropriate, undignified in a leader. Dad was always very dignified, very conscious of human dignity, but he would have applauded lots of economic policies much more than, than Biden. Um, he would have liked what China's doing in, um, in markets, uh, but would have heavily disapproved of the, the overwhelming state uh, control and authority. He was very charmed to meet Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore and to, to chat with him. He would have loved what's happened in, in Singapore and, and in many far um, East Pacific Rim uh, countries. Um, he he uh, was an optimist about human uh, nature. He was more a Rousseauian than a uh, uh, than, than a Hobbesian, um, and uh, he, he believed in the dignity of, of of human beings and in the ability to for them to make their own 
decisions. He, he disliked the atrophy, um, the atrophying tendency of, of doing too much for people. He, he just felt we should help people learn how to help themselves. And to that end, then, I think he would have applauded positive psychology, which is uh, very much trying to get people away from antidepressant pills, 80 million uh, prescriptions in the UK alone, helping to give people the, their own ability to stand on their own feet. I'm constantly surprised why the IEA doesn't embrace the work of Seligman uh, and, and positive psychology, positive education about human dignity and human uh, efficacy, human autonomy, and moving away from victimhood. So I think he would have liked all that. Um, and, um, you know, there are parts of, uh, of I think he'd have liked Sunak more than, um, uh, he was very keen on, uh, on a Indian economist called uh, Sudha Shanoi, who uh, wrote papers in the IEA 40 plus years ago. I think he'd have liked uh, Rishi personally and, and, and ideologically uh, more than um, uh, the Prime Minister. Um, and so I, he'd, have, he'd have, look, he'd have found good things to say about everybody because that, that was his way. Thank you very much, Anthony, for that. It's, it's been uh, fascinating to talk to talk about your father. You mentioned earlier on this, this book of Colin Robinson's, which yeah. uh, is an excellent book. And uh, we have some copies of it, the IEA. And if anybody who's watching wants to get a copy, if they'd like to send us a uh, five pound donation or something to cover the cost of, of post and packing, we, could, we can do that. It's a very interesting read. Anyway, thank you, Anthony. Uh, I'll see you again soon. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, they were wonderful questions. You've made me think so much, Len. Um, and thank you very much to the IEA, and thank you very much to those, everyone who, who's listened um, to. And, and, and do buy a copy of, of Dad's uh, book, uh, Five Pound Donation, cheap at the price, as Dad would have said. <laughs> thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you very, very much indeed.